thank you for coming. This is the um, fifth of a series of lectures on adventures in foreign policy drawn from the 50 chapters in these two books accumulated over a half a century of work in foreign policy. And the goal of these talks is to show that small things can make big differences in foreign policy. This is the motto of activists like myself, and these talks will show it. And they will also show people how your government actually works, which is often quite humorous. Uh, and the talks are very interesting to me because I've been looking into not only what happened to me, and these, these talks are all about things that happened to me in my adventures, but in the interval between the time these things happened, a lot of information has been revealed about what was really going on. And you can find it in sources like Wikipedia and other books published after the events. And so I now know much more about what was really going on at the time I was having these interactions with the Central Intelligence Agency. Now this talk has three parts. In the first part, I talk about illegal operations uh, that took place uh, in the period from uh, 67 to 75 in an operation called Chaos. But in the second part, I talk about my constructive work in helping the CIA get together with the KGB on matters of common interest like drugs and criminal operations and proliferation. And in the third part, I talk about uh, 20 years of collaboration in his retirement with a very distinguished former director of the Central Intelligence Agency. So these are the three parts. Now, um, what uh, you should understand that surveillance of Americans is an FBI function. The Central Intelligence Agency's job is to spy on foreigners. They are not supposed to spy on you and me. But what happened was that in uh, 1964, 67, uh, there were all these demonstrations against the Vietnamese War. And J. Edgar Hoover reported to Lyndon Johnson that the Russians were behind these demonstrations. This was completely not true. And the director of Central Intelligence, Richard Helms, told Lyndon Johnson it was not true. But uh, Lyndon Johnson had heard this from J. Edgar Hoover, and Secretary of State Rusk agreed with Hoover. And so did Walt Rostow, who was a, a high national security advisor for uh, President Johnson. So Johnson called in Richard Helms, the head of the Central Intelligence Agency, and said, I want you to check on what Hoover is telling me and he ordered the CIA to begin a surveillance of Americans, which was illegal, in order to check on whether the Russians were behind the anti-Vietnam War demonstrations. So there's a picture of J. Edgar Hoover on the right and Lyndon Johnson on the left. So the operation in CIA was called Chaos, and it was turned over to the head of counterintelligence in the CIA, a man named uh, James Jesus Engleton, that's him. He had started as a poet. He was a very literate man, somewhat mystical, and very, um, he became, I think, over the course of his tenure as head of counterintelligence in the CIA, became rather paranoid. After years of looking for spies, moles, inside the CIA, he had finally reached the conclusion that some heads of the Central Intelligence Agency were Russian moles, you know, and he was really going uh, overboard about it. And, uh, uh, but anyway, he was in charge of counterintelligence, so he was put in charge of this, uh, of this uh, operation. Uh, people said he was fanatic about everything, and I think that uh, he did have that tendency. Now, in 1967, uh, a left-wing magazine named Ramparts wrote a story uh, saying that the CIA had infiltrated the National Student Association and was funding it as a kind of front operation. They were doing this in part to surveil the National Student Association, but also in part they wanted to put people in there so that they could then say to the Russians later, we have credentials, we were in the peace movement, and they could sort of place their agents, you know, give them credentials, left-wing credentials. Anyway, when the CIA realized that the, their operation with the National Student Association was going to be blown by ramparts, uh, 
they began playing dirty tricks on ramparts, and they uh, and they started uh, sort of blackmailing a man in the National Student Association who knew about this, and saying that we knew he you'd been to a psychiatrist, we're going to reveal your psychiatric record, we're going to say you're crazy. When I read about all this in the press, I decided the Central Intelligence Agency played too rough for me and that in any things I was doing, I should stay clear of them. It was because of the threat to blackmail this guy with a psychiatric certificate that sort of warned me off. And, uh, but in 1970, in June 1970, President Nixon decided to expand this operation. He had been told by Helms that there was no uh, Soviet uh, 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 participation in these demonstrations against the Vietnamese War, which I'm sure is pretty evident to all of you. Nevertheless, he brought together uh, three people and said, I want this program intensified. He put Hoover in charge, that's Hoover on the left. Helms was on the committee, there is Secretary Helm, uh, 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 CIA Director Helms with Nixon, and this man, Admiral Noel Geiler, who was head of the National Security Agency, the NSA, which does the wiretapping and the signals intelligence, listening in on people. Hoover, of course, had been head of the FBI since it was founded. He was a very peculiar man. H half the books about him say he was a cross-dressing homosexual. Other books deny it. Uh, he had a very strange personal life, I won't go into it, but he was put in charge of this committee. And uh, Helms had grown up in a very elite way in foreign schools in Switzerland, he would learned French and German, and he had been a high official in the OSS during World War II in Switzerland, uh, helping the, in the war against the Nazis. He was a very urbane intellectual person, always very well dressed. And this man, Admiral Noel Geiler, whom I got to know when he retired and worked in the peace movement with me, I helped him on a number of things. He was a four-star admiral who was uh, very famous for one thing, he shot down Admiral Yamamoto. During, during World War II, you know, uh, we had broken the naval code of the Japanese and we learned that Admiral Yamamoto was flying from point A to point B in a single plane so it wouldn't attract attention. And we wanted to shoot it down but we didn't want people to know how did we know where he was there? Because then they would know we had broken the code, then they would change their code breaking machines, then we would be in trouble. So uh, he, uh, he was sent up there alone to be up in the sky and to come down when Admiral Yamamoto passed by and shoot him down and then disappear himself so that there'd be no trace of who had killed Admiral Yamamoto. So this man was a very distinguished uh, war veteran and he, uh, he, he won the Naval Cross three times, you know, so a very distinguished man. And uh, later, after he was head of NSA, he was head of all of our forces in the Pacific. So, um, now in June of 1970, I was supposed to start working as the president of the Federation of American Scientists. But the Federation of American Scientists didn't have any money. They had a thousand members paying seven dollars dues each. So the annual budget was seven thousand dollars. And even in those days, it wasn't enough. And I was offered a job to be editor of Foreign Policy magazine, which was a new magazine and uh, was going to pay me $10,000 a year for half-time work and then I could work at the Federation half-time. So I was considering this. And uh, uh, this man, Sam Huntington, uh, was a very famous uh, Harvard professor, conservative, and he had met me when I was writing books at Harvard at the Center for International Affairs. And he had recommended me to the publisher, a man named Warren Manchell. And Warren Manchell was working with this man, Crystal, a famous conservative who was the editor of the Public Interest magazine. And Crystal and Manchell were taking me to lunch and they were wooing me to run this magazine and I was trying to decide whether to do it. And Manchell said to me at one point, late at night in his apartment, he said, midnight is striking, uh, Jeremy, what are you going to decide? And then he took a phone call and I heard him say, did you say M for million or B for billion? And I realized he was, you know, a very affluent stockbroker. Anyway, I went to the Council on Foreign Relations where I was a member. They had a clipping file where they kept clippings of various things and foreign policy. And I started looking at this clipping file. And I saw something that really astonished and disturbed me. 
I saw that uh, this man, Crystal, and Warren Manchell, the publisher, had actually been running a magazine before called Encounter, and Encounter had been subsidized by the CIA. And I realized that Manchell, I, uh, the Council on Foreign Relations showed me his biography because he was also a member and I was a fellow member, and I saw he had been a member of the CIA from 52 to 54. And Sam, who had recommended me to Manchell, had once said to me, you know, Manchell was in the CIA, but I don't think, I'm not sure he ever left it. And so, and he had been, Manchell had been the executive director of, a, of the Congress, um, it was called the uh, Congress of, um, um, I forget the name of the Congress that had run Encounter, and he had been the witting person that knew the CIA was funding the money to Encounter. So I became alarmed. I thought, well, you know, I'm a liberal, and they might be using me to be a front for this new magazine, which is run by conservatives who had been running this uh, CIA magazine. So I called Sam, and I said, Sam, listen, I, I don't think I can really do this. And Manchel called me, uh, realizing I wasn't going to do it, and he said, you know, if people thought that this magazine had some serious problem, we couldn't get it started. And I said, well, Mr. Manchel, I'm not planning to cause trouble for your magazine. I just don't want to be part of it. So um, I then moved on to running the Federation uh, full time. And uh, I had a one-room office right there in this building, which was run by the Quakers, the Friends Committee on National Legislation. They had a building right across the street from the Senate. So I was in a one-room office because we didn't have much money right there. And I hired a secretary. Now this secretary was not like your usual secretaries in the peace movement who usually have two-finger typing. She typed 90 words a minute. The first thing she told me was, you got to get your picture taken by Bachrock, who, you know, gave me one of those ex executive pose pictures. And, you know, she was the sort of secretary that a high-class executive would have. And uh, she had been turned down by other groups in the peace movement who thought she was not their type. But I hired her. But after a while, I just was, became disturbed. First of all, one day I came back, she said, over the weekend I took your Rolodex home and uh, cleaned it up. So I thought, well, why is she taking my Rolodex home for the weekend to clean up? She could do this during the day. And then I came back from a trip and she said, well, I, I went through all your letters and I cleaned up your files. So I thought, wow, this is, <laughs> this is spying. Somebody has, you know, hired her to transmit information about what we're doing here. And she had also told me uh, once that she had been, during a Senate campaign in California where Pierre Salinger was running for the Senate, that she had worked for Pierre Salinger as a spy for the opposing Senate camp. Now, I, 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 I knew that psychiatrists talked about something called leakage, you know? The man lies on the couch for an hour and says nothing, and then as he approaches the door, he says, well, you know, I hate my mother. And the, and the psychiatrist realizes there's the heart of it, just leaked out of him. So anybody that tells you they were a spy and some other thing, I mean, they're hinting that they're a spy now, and she'd been doing all these things, so I fired her. I started getting uh, uh, calls at night. Uh, uh, she was pretty angry, and she said, you seem like a nice guy on the surface, but you're really a mean person, and I realized that this was going to go into my CIA file. She was acting out how she was going to denounce me, and, uh, but I didn't know it was the CIA at that time. I didn't know, you know, where she was from. I, uh, there were rumors that the Army was running an intelligence operation. We didn't really know. And anyway, I started getting calls in the middle of the night and uh, waking me up, and then there would be nobody there. And uh, so then I got her phone number, and I called her, and then the call stopped. You know, I called her in the middle of the night, and then she stopped doing this. And, um, and last week, after 40 years, 40 years have passed, I confirmed uh, that she was working for the CIA. Because first of all, in looking, uh, I now knew from all the books show that Operation Chaos was being run by the CIA and that they were putting people in the peace movement things and trying to get all the data about the peace movement. But in addition, I called People Finder. You know what People Finder is? If you want to find somebody, you can call up the white pages and if you pay $37, you can find all the addresses where a person lived in past 
times, and they can even give you the names of the people who are neighbors of the person, you know, next door, and you can ask them. I mean, you can do your own FBI investigation, and you can find out anything about anybody. So I called them up and I said, well, you know, this was uh, 40 years ago. You probably don't have information on this woman. She has a very peculiar name. Uh, and she, her, her address was in the Watergate, and they said, oh, well, well, we'll check. Just hang on, we'll check. So they checked immediately while I was on the phone. They said, yeah, we, we have her in that Watergate address, and we have a previous address, but we don't have any addresses after that. Oh, I said, that's unusual. I thought she was working for the CIA and spying on me. Oh, the woman said, they can put in a stop. Meaning, if the CIA wants, they can tell people finder, don't follow our people around because they don't want the Russians to be able to track, you know, people that they learn are agents, where they're living, what they're doing. So, you know, 40 years, in this modern age, you can not only find out what happened 40 years ago in Wikipedia, but you can actually find out with PeopleFinder. So, um, um, in uh, 1971, uh, so that was the first episode, and uh, part of the first episode. And then I began writing a newsletter. The Federation of American Scientists was working on nuclear problems, disarmament, but I didn't want to just write about that. I thought that'd be too boring for our members. So I began writing about other things, and I thought I'd write a letter, a newsletter, on the privacy of communications in American life, eavesdropping and mail covers. So I wanted to know, you know, who's eavesdropping and who's and mail covers means that the FBI could go to a judge and they could say, uh, uh, we want to fill out a form. We won't open the mail, but we want a, a report on the outside of the mail, who's writing to whom in both directions. And they could do that. That was called a mail cover. So I began to write about this. As part of writing about this, I did something which had very far-reaching consequences. So this is the ultimate small thing makes big difference. I wrote a letter to the chief postal inspector. And I said, do you ever, uh, you know, open letters without permission of a judge or uh, let anybody else do it, you know? What about that? And uh, after a while, I had to write it a second time. Finally got an answer. He said, oh, no, no, we don't do this. Ch Chief Postal Inspector said, we don't do this. Now, in fact, uh, they were doing this. The CIA was opening the mail of Americans in three different installations, in LA, in New York, and also in New Orleans. They had machinery that was so efficient that they could open the letters and reseal them and copy them uh, so quickly. You couldn't see any sign of tampering and so quickly that you wouldn't interfere with the normal flow of the mail. And they were opening mail from people like Bella Abzug, Linus Pauling, John Steinbeck, Martin Luther King, Hubert Humphrey. Anybody that was writing to the Soviet Union or China on the letters that were going back and forth were being opened by the CIA. This program had been going on for a very long time, before Operation Chaos. And uh, uh, I even have copies of some of the letters that they opened of mine, because they turned over the letters they opened to the FBI. And if you asked the FBI under the Freedom of Information Act for information about yourself, they would give you stuff. And so I actually got letters I'd written to Russia back from the FBI that had gone through the CIA mail opening project to the FBI and back to me. So, you know, I, it was definitely going on. Now, the person I wrote to, the inspector general, became alarmed when he saw my letter. Why was he alarmed? Well, it turned out he was the only person in the post office that knew that the CIA was opening the mail. No one else in the post office knew. And how did he know? Well, guess what? His last job had been head of the CIA mail opening project. <laughs> and guess why he had been made chief postal inspector? The Central Intelligence Agency figured, well, uh, if we make him chief postal inspector, it'll be a promotion for him and he'll never let anybody find out about this program because he used to run it. So he was the perfect man to provide cover for it. So he was the only one that knew and the letter he wrote to me was not true. Now he became alarmed for another reason. I built up the Federation by getting a lot of famous people on the letterhead. In the end, I had 57 Nobel Prize winners, and I had other famous people. I had this man, Herbert Scoville. Now, he had been deputy director of the Central Intelligence Agency. Why did we have him? Well, we were a scientific group, and he had been the deputy director for science and technology of the Central Intelligence Agency. He was a great guy. 
and uh, very well informed and had very good credentials. He was retired from the CIA. So we had made him, at one time he was our treasurer. So he was on our masthead. So when, uh, when Cotter, the postmaster general inspector, the inspector, saw Scoville's name, he thought, wow, Scoville, uh, he was a consumer of this program, Hitlingual. The program was called Hitlingual, H.T. Lingual. And uh, he meant that Scoville had the authority to read the letters we were opening, you know, so he knew we were doing it. So he thought, well, maybe uh, Stone, who wrote me this letter, maybe Scoville told him, maybe they know. So he called up Helms and he said, you got to close this down. I work for the Postmaster General now. I don't work for the CIA. This is illegal. This is hazardous. I want you to stop it. And Helms said, well, could you give me a month to think about this, look into this? So uh, Cotter said, okay. So Helms called Attorney General Mitchell. Now, as you recall, Attorney General Mitchell was a crook. He went to jail over Watergate, you know, and uh, uh, Mitchell's approach to law and order, you know, uh, was, uh, uh, well, he was the only Attorney General in the history of the United States to, uh, to be uh, found guilty of uh, corruption, uh, of, of criminal activities. So Mitchell said, me, you worry about a little mail opening, no problem. So Helms said, okay, Mitchell, tell the Postmaster General Blunt, that's Mr. Blunt playing tennis, to tell his subordinate, the Inspector General of the Post Office, to lay off. And this was done. So Cotter was told to butt out and shut up, and that was done. Now in 1972, uh, Cotter complained again. At that point, Mitchell had left uh, the government to run Nixon's re-election campaign, and the Postmaster General had retired, and Cotter felt exposed now, and he called Helms again, and he said, Helms, you got to cut it out. I won't do this anymore. And Helms said, would you give me some time to work on this? And Cotter said, no. Now, shortly thereafter, Helms was fired, was, uh, Helms uh, lost his job as head of the Central Intelligence Agency because he refused to cooperate with Nixon in using the Central Intelligence Agency to get the FBI to butt out of the investigation of Watergate. So when Helms didn't cooperate, uh, Nixon decided to make him ambassador to Iran. Because Helms had grown up in a Swiss uh, private finishing school, and the Shah of Iran had been there too, and they'd been classmates together. So Helms was sent to Iran, and the Central Intelligence Agency had new leaders. One was Schlesinger, a very distinguished man, who after six months was made uh, Secretary of Defense. And Colby, who became the head of uh, the uh, plans operation in the CIA where they do the black work, the spying work. Now, Schles I wrote Schlesinger at the time when he took over as CIA, and I said, I hope you'll stop, uh, you know, any bad things that the CIA is doing. I never expected to get an answer. People in charge of the Central Intelligence Agency are quite busy. But I got an answer from Schlesinger, and he said, Dr. Stone, if there's anything anachronistic going on around here, I'm going to stop it. And he meant it. And uh, at one point, he started firing C people in the CIA, and the White House called up and said, you're firing people, you're firing people. It had been the policy not to fire anybody because it was thought that a disgruntled agency employee might spill the beans, so nobody was fired. Schlesinger told the White House, firing people? I'm just trying to make room so I can move around in the aisles around here. <laughs> so, uh, and so at this point, this uh, mail question had been kicked up to them, and Bill Colby, a great guy who will, you will hear more about in this, uh, in this talk, he was a lawyer. And guess what he did? He went to the CIA Law Library and he looked it up and he said, look, it's against the law. We've got to stop this. This had not been the Central Intelligence Agency position before. They were a rough, tough gang who were doing rough, tough stuff abroad. And when they were ordered to do things at home, they continued doing rough, tough stuff. And they didn't ask, is this legal? But Colby did. So Colby closed down the uh, uh, Hitlingual uh, program. And, uh, and in May of 73, Schlesinger uh, 
uh, realizing that from Watergate, you know, one of the Watergate burglars was a CIA person, had been a CIA person, so Schlesinger sent a memo throughout the CIA, I want to know everything that's been done that's illegal. So he collected what were called the family jewels. And to the horror of the Central Intelligence Agency, after Schlesinger left for the Defense Department and Colby became head of the Central Intelligence Agency, Colby turned them over to the Congress. Colby believed in congressional oversight. I mean, the number of people in the Central Intelligence Agency that were furious about this was legion. In fact, while Schlesinger was uh, director of Central Intelligence, they had to put, he had his portrait up in the hall with the other directors in, in the agency building. They had to put up a surveillance camera in front of his portrait to make sure that nobody would deface his portrait. <laughs> That's called internal monitoring. S so, uh, so it was a whole new crowd uh, running things. Nixon was still president, but the CIA had changed completely. Now, in 1974, Cy Hirsch, the jur famous journalist who investigated the My Lai massacre in Vietnam, he went to see Colby, and he said, Colby, uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to publish an article in the New York Times about uh, CIA spying. He said, I'm going to publish an article, and this is it. Huge CIA operation reported in U.S. against anti-war forces and other dissidents in Nixon years. Files on citizens. Helms reportedly got surveillance data in charter violation. It was a violation of the CIA charter. So Colby, hearing about this, fired Engleton, who by that time thought Colby was probably a Russian mole. And... Uh, uh, and uh, so this was the end of Operation Chaos, but by this time, the, the Central Intelligence Agency had files on 7,000 U.S. citizens, of which I'm confident I am one because of my secretary, and I'm sure it says in it, he seems nice on the surface, but he's really a bad guy, and over 1,000 domestic groups had been written up. You know, so everything from the Quakers to the Weathermen had, you know, been surveilled. And so these files all still exist. By this time, by the way, by 1972, you should know that the CIA Inspector General was already complaining to the high command, why are we doing this? This is a violation of our charter. And there were young Turks in the CIA who were signing petitions to the management saying, this is illegal, why are we doing this, you know? There are always a lot of liberals in the uh, CIA and... Uh, uh, and so they were complaining about it. Now, as a result of this article you saw, a Rockefeller Commission was set up to investigate exactly what happened. And so four years after I, this is Governor Rockefeller, later Vice President, uh, in 1975, it was four years after I wrote my letter to the Chief Postal Inspector. I knew nothing of what I've just told you at, during those four years. But a reporter called me up and he said, Jeremy, I've been reading the report of the Rockefeller Commission and it says that uh, an association of scientists wrote to the <coughs> chief postal inspector uh, and started this chain of events. Were you the association? I said, well, yes, that was my letter. And that was when I learned all the things that were going on. And uh, so that was a great revelation. And... Um, uh, now, Senator Church, um, so the next thing that happened was I got a call from the CIA and they said, hey, we have something for you. We're sending it over by messenger. Wow, I thought. He said to me, you know, you made a Freedom of Information Act request to us about any uh, unclassified material you might have on me, have on you. And we, we gave you some things, and you complained later that you'd been to Russia five times, and they must have more than that. And uh, we said no. But now we found something, and we're sending it over by messenger. So I thought, well, there is something fishy in the state of Denmark, because this is not the normal service from a government agency. They find something, and they send it over by messenger. So I opened this thing up when the messenger arrived. And I almost fainted. I mean, it was a memorandum of conversation of the highest officials of the Central Intelligence Agency, 
uh, discussing uh, their decision to continue committing a criminal act. So I thought, why are they sending this to me? It was uh, a meeting uh, of the director of central intelligence, the deputy director for plans, that's the covert operations, the chief of counterintelligence, the deputy chief of counterintelligence, the director of security for the entire CIA, and the chief of the mail opening project. So they were all sitting around for 45 minutes, and uh, they were, uh, were discussing, uh, this was in, um, uh, they were discussing this whole question of my letter to the chief postal inspector. And uh, this, I have this uh, memo here. It's in very high class language. The note taker uses words like opined. And um, the DCI opened the meeting with a reference to an inquiry as to possible mail tampering by government agencies addressed to the chief postal inspector, Mr. Cotter, by Dr. Jeremy J. Stone on behalf of the Federation of American Scientists. On the question as to what may have prompted the letter, the DDP, that's the Director of Plans, mentioned the possibility that the information might have come from deleted. Well, that was Scoville who had worked for them. And it was stated that, de that deleted had been a consumer of Hitlingual for many years and could not know that Hitlingual had continued beyond the time when he was informed of it. And the DCI stated he was not over concerned about Scoville. They w it went on in this high class language the secretary, uh, the director of central intelligence said, what prompted Stone's letter? Does anybody know? They didn't. He said, who else knows about this? They said, only the little gray man. He said, who's the little gray man? Well, that's uh, the man we pay $50 a month in the post office to trundle the bundles from uh, the post office facility into the CIA room where we do the work and then take them back. And uh, only Cotter knew. The previous inspector general didn't want to know because he wanted to be able to testify to Congress and deny knowing. So uh, they said, and Mr. Helms, we give the information to the FBI. He said, well, how many people know in the FBI? And he said, just a few. And uh, does the FBI show it to others? No. So uh, the DCI, that's Mr. Helms, opined. I had never seen the word opined before. So you could see the Central Intelligence was a high class operation from an intellectual point of view. Uh, he thought the FBI should do this because they could better withstand the publicity. In other words, it was illegal, but at least for the FBI, they were charged with domestic surveillance. So it was only one illegal thing, opening the letters. For the CIA, it was two illegal things. They were doing surveillance and they were opening the letters. So Helms said, you know, why are we doing this? And they discussed whether we should continue. And Engleton said, yeah, we should continue. And so Helms said, okay. Uh, but I want to be kept informed of anything that happens here and so, so I was astonished to get this memo because they were admitting it was uh, illegal activity and they were sending this memo, illegal, they were doing this, they could all be sent to jail for this was my point of view and I was just wondering uh, why had they sent me this memo. Now at that time, Senator Church was running a committee in Congress investigating CIA operations as a result of Cy Hirsch's uh, article in the New York Times. And the man who was chief of staff of, for church was a man named William Miller who was a very close friend of mine. Now my office was 100 yards away from the Senate, so I walked over with this memo and I said, Bill, take a look at this. All these CIA officials talking about criminal activity. Uh, oh, he said, we have this memo. In fact, he said, we declassified it. Cotter is testifying today and we declassified the memo so we could question him about it. So I suddenly realized that the reason the CIA had sent it to me and by messenger was because they realized that I had asked for everything about myself and I would complain that I hadn't been shown this when I saw it in the hearing record and they better send it to me before I saw it in the hearing record. But then guess what? Senator Church looked at this memo which William Miller had told him to use in the hearings and said, well, you know, this is a friend of mine, this Scoville, and, uh, you know, this could be a can of worms for him, and so he didn't use it. <laughs> so the CIA had sent it to me, uh, in effect, by mistake, because it never showed up in the church committee records, and I never would have known about it if they hadn't sent it to me. Of course, I published it in the 
FAS newsletter. So such is life in Washington. Uh, so then uh, I thought about something. I called Mr. Cotter and I said, Mr. Cotter, I got your letter in front of me, the one you sent me saying you weren't doing this. It's a rather complicated letter. I want to know, was this a, uh, a, a purposefully misleading letter or a, 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 a deliberate or a deliberately false letter? In other words, because in Washington, usually uh, government officials don't lie to you. They usually send you some complicated thing which has a loophole and there, you know, it's can be thought to be true in some way, the way lawyers would do. They don't usually tell you a lie, you know. It's too crude. And so I asked Cotter, you know, what was this? Oh, he said, well, you know, it was a lie. He said, after all, look, I was witting to the operation and uh, I was not allowed to tell, so I said we weren't doing it. Now, I knew that I could go to jail for five years if I told a lie to a government official. For example, during the McCarthy period, if the FBI asked someone, are you a communist? And the man said, no. And the FBI said, we have information that you are. Such a man could go to jail. And one, I knew one that did. You know, there was a story about one that did. So you could go to jail for lying to a government official. But it appeared that a government official could lie to me without anything happening. So I went to Senator Kennedy and I pointed out that this was an anomaly. And he introduced a bill to make government lying a, a uh, criminal act. But the bill never passed, as you might well imagine. <laughs> so uh, that ends the first stage of my interactions with the Central Intelligence Agency. Now, in the second stage, which happened uh, 20 years later, I did something uh, very constructive, helping the CIA and cooperating with them and working with the highest CIA officials. And it all started in a very humorous way, which I'm about to describe. I was, uh, you, you know this man, Mr. Gates. That's a younger version of the man you just saw retiring as Secretary of Defense. That's Robert Gates. He's a wonderful man. And uh, he got the Medal of Honor when he retired from, by the President for his work as Secretary of Defense. And uh, at that time, he was the deputy, at the time of this picture, he was the deputy head of the CIA, deputy director, and he was giving a talk at the American Association for the Advancement of Science in this building. And 200 scientists had convened to hear him talk about Russia. He had a PhD in Russian studies, and he was giving a lecture on Russia. So he gave his lecture, and then he said, okay, I'm ready to receive questions no matter how irreverent. irreverent. So I said, well, Dr. Gates, I have an irreverent question. He said, what? I said, well, none of us would take sex education courses from a virgin, no matter how well informed on sex the virgin was. Because after all, without practical experience, you know, would you want to take these sex, edu sex education courses? So I said, what I want to know is, you know a lot about Russia. You have a PhD in it. But have you ever been to Russia? Have you ever had intercourse with the Russians? So, of course, all the scientists burst out laughing, and Gates started answering this with a very long answer, which ended up with, no, he had never been there. I was shocked. I said, how many other CIA analysts on Russia are virgins, too, and have never been to Russia? I had been there many times, and I was, it appeared I knew more than the CIA. Well, at that point, the moderator, who had been a graduate of the CIA, said, I am not taking any more questions that denigrate the Central Intelligence Agency. So after the talk was over, I went up to see Gates and I said, Dr. Gates, I didn't mean to embarrass you. The fact of the matter is, I'm in the middle of a campaign trying to get senators and congressmen to visit Russia so that they would at least know what they were talking about. And I'd been doing this for some time. And I said, I can get you an invitation to go to Russia if you want to go. Do you want to go? Well, I got a gray answer from him. You know, these high officials see I are very good at giving answers that are neither yes nor no. But I thought, well, he didn't say no. So I, so I wrote a letter to the ambassador, Dubinin. Here's Ambassador Dubinin, the Russian ambassador at the time, talking to Reagan. And I got no answer. But a few weeks later, there was a very important event at the National Academy of Sciences. Andrei Sakharov, the Nobel Prize winner and the inventor of the Russian hydrogen bomb, had finally gotten permission to come to America. The scientists were all welcoming him. I had been his biggest defender in America. Uh, for his human rights activities in Russia, and so I was there as an important guest, and Dubinin was there. 
And I said to Dubinin, did you get my letter about this funny story where I called Gates a virgin and he's never been to Russia and all? And so Dubinin started laughing and he said, no, I never got the letter. He said, send it to me again, mark it personal. You know, the KGB has a bad habit of interfering with ambassadorial activities by stealing their mail and deal, trying to deal with things themselves. So I sent it to him again. And while I was, after I did that, I wrote to the director of Central Intelligence, who was Judge Webster. He had been head of the FBI. He was a wonderful man and a judge. And I said, you know, you should be working with the KGB on common interests, including proliferation, terrorist activities, drug trafficking, threat perception, third world developments, and mutual misconceptions. Because, uh, you know, you may be spying on each other's countries, but you have very great common interests in these things. And so I wrote Judge Webster about this, and I began uh, uh, talking to, uh, there was a, a Russian in town who ran a think tank I knew, Arbatov, and I asked him to talk to the Russian KGB about this. And uh, so I was, that's what I was thinking of. And then, uh, right after New Year's Day, a, uh, an official in charge of security at the Russian embassy came to my office and he said, I am here to give you an answer to your letter to Ambassador Dubinin. It has been considered at the highest level with understanding and support. And uh, we are prepared to receive the highest level of the CIA in entire security and confidentiality. They can come as guests of the American ambassador or they can come uh, as, uh, you know, privately without that. And anyway, they'll be protected. And uh, I said, okay, now how many officials the CIA does this cover? You know, I was trying to find out what this really meant. He said, well, the head of Central Intelligence and the four deputy heads, you know, the five highest officials. Well, I said, oh, very good. I will inform the Central Intelligence Agency. So I, by this time, I had never been at the Central Intelligence Agency headquarters, but I would be sending them stuff by mail or messenger when there was some emergency need like this, you know. So this was big news. I mean, this was big news and an answer to my letter. So I sent this to Judge Webster. There's Judge Webster. He was such a great FBI director that I wrote him a letter commending him once about it. I really liked him. Um, and guess what? Uh, two days before this guy called on me, I discovered in the news that the uh, KGB director in Moscow had invited our ambassador, Matlock, to meet with him. Now, that had never happened before. You know, Ambassador Matlock had never met the head of the Russian KGB or anything like that. So things were really changing in Moscow. And uh, in January, that same month, I got encouragement from two sources. <clears throat> First of all, the deputy director of the CIA, Mr. Gates, Dr. Gates, wrote me and he said, events had moved too rapidly for me or Judge Webster to respond immediately to your letter about all the ways we should cooperate. But your suggestions and initiatives were quite interesting. And he hoped I would provide new insights about your original ideas. So, you know, I was working in a one-room office at that time, you know, and I thought, well, this is terrific. People are really paying attention to my ideas. And uh, he said, I'm moving on to the National Security Council now. He had been made uh, deputy, uh, I guess, National Security Advisor. And, uh, and may now maybe I'll get to Russia. You know, he did get to Russia later uh, as part of a delegation with Secretary Baker. It took him along and <clears throat> he saw that the tomatoes were spoiled, rotten, and the streets were dirty. And he began to see the things about Russia that made a big difference in people's perception of the Russian threat. And which was the reason why I was trying to get congressmen and senators to go there to see how poor Russia was and how badly it operated. So anyway, he was encouraging me. And then Senator Cohen, this is Bill Cohen. He was a Republican from Maine, later became Secretary of Defense himself. He was a friend of mine, and uh, I, uh, he was then on the Intelligence Committee. And he wrote me a letter, and he said, your efforts to encourage reciprocal official visits of the United States and Soviet Union, meaning congressmen and senators, which he was well aware of. In fact, I had arranged his trip to Russia, his first trip to Russia, um, have played an important role and provide an excellent base on which to build further cooperative steps, which meant between the intelligence communities. So I thought, wow, this is uh, really good. 
But nothing happened. Two years went by and nothing happened. And I made a trip to North Korea. Now, North Korea is a real hellhole. There's, it's got less freedom and liberty than any country on earth. It's a lot like 1984, you know, uh, Orwellian society. Everything's under control. And um, I made these trips to these kind of countries to, to see if there's anything useful I could do. And uh, when I came back, I had one idea. And that idea was we should be cooperating with the Russians on North Korea because we didn't have an embassy in North Korea. We didn't recognize them, but the Russians did have an embassy in North Korea, so they knew more than we did. So cooperation with the Russians on North Korea would be a good deal. So I called the State Department and asked the North Korean desk, are we getting any help from the Russians on North Korea? He said, no. I said, well, would it be a good thing? He said, oh, absolutely. I said, well, I'll see what I can do. And um, so I, um, I wrote a letter. I called up the Russian embassy and asked for this guy, Borovikov, who had talked to me before, and his replacement came. And he was the liaison for Primakov. Well, I have to, uh, I have to explain that um, this man, Primakov, had been made head of the Foreign Intelligence Service for the KGB. Now, he was not really a KGB man at all. He had been head of a think tank, a think tank like the Rand Corporation. Gorbachev had, when Gorbachev took over in Russia, his idea was to break the power of these agencies by putting people in charge of them that did not rise up from the agencies. He called this breaking the ring. Because otherwise he thought these agencies will never do what I want them to do. And he wanted to make change. So he had taken Primakov, who had been head of a kind of a RAND Institute called the International Institute for World Economy and International Relations. And I had known Primakov in that capacity. In fact, once while I was in Russia, he said he was going to Russia. And I said, oh, I've been there before. I'll brief you in Russia. And I briefed them on Russia. Now he was the head of foreign intelligence for the KGB. So this man came to see me from the U.S. Embassy. He said, he said well, Primakov has already given me uh, authority to talk about drugs and uh, proliferation and crime, but nothing's happening. They're not, they're not doing anything. So I sent him a letter to Primakov, gave him a letter for Primakov from me, saying this should be done. And within a few days, I, I got a letter back from Primakov. Uh, anyway, this man came back and he said, here's your answer. He said, your contributions to nonproliferation are highly appreciated. Primakov knows your highest scientific qualifications, which is quite an exaggeration, uh, but thrown in, I think, to help Primakov defend himself against charges. I mean, you know, he's dealing with a high scientist. So. He said, uh, your testimony to Senator Cranston's committee, I had sent my testimony to Cranston's committee, which I had made after I came back from North Korea. I had testified about it. He said, we'll be compared with what we have in any case, and then we'll plan different contacts between Russians and American representatives on North Korea. And uh, in any case, we're ready for all forms of constructive cooperation uh, with the USA, including its special services. And later I got a written message confirming this and saying, we include confidential cooperation with all states, individuals, and organizations. Uh, in averting proliferation. In other words, the Russians were as frightened as we were of the spread of the nuclear bomb everywhere. And, uh, and then he said, you know, my mind was already blown by this. You know, a lot of my efforts came to naught. This one was coming to something. I was quite happy. Then he said, and I cannot help mentioning that from now we can already see results of implementing of some of your recommendations by the diplomatic service of your country. Well, that was news to me. The Central Intelligence Agency had not, you know, said, hey, we're following up on your ideas and here's what we're doing. But according to the Russian intelligence, they were. So I was quite happy about that. Now, uh, but I thought, well, they say they'll work with even organizations, you know, and uh, I thought, well, I have an organization, the Federation of American Scientists. So um, by this time, William Colby had retired. That's him in retirement. He's sitting in the parlor of my vacation house in the Chesapeake Bay, playing chess with my chess machine. And I went to Colby, who by that time was my friend, and I said, look, um, they're willing to cooperate with organizations. How about we get together, you and me, and we invite a representative of the KGB 
think tank who knows a lot about North Korea, and we introduce them to other groups here that know about North Korea, and we start getting some exchanges going on North Korea. He said, great. So we sent an invitation to do that, but we heard nothing. Eight months later, guess what? Gates is in Russia, the first director of central intelligence ever to be in Russia. There he is. There's Yeltsin. There's Primakov. There's the director of Russian security. They're all grinning from ear to ear. And Gates has had his first trip as director of central intelligence. And guess what? Here they are. Here's Gates. Here's Primakov. What are they discussing? North Korea. They had made North Korea their first uh, choice for cooperation between the two camps. And they had actually decided, I learned later, that they would make this a test case of the sincerity of the Russians. And if this worked well, they would you know, move on to crime and, and uh, other things. But North Korea, they felt, was a really good way to start. Because, as I say, the North Koreans, uh, the Russians had an embassy there. However, I have to tell you that I was on the train going across. My wife and I took the train from, uh, uh, from uh, Khabarovsk on the uh, east coast of Russia to Moscow, you know, across Siberia. And at a rest stop there, there was a Russian. I said, where are you coming from? He said, I'm from North, uh, coming from North Korea. I was the military liaison for the Russian embassy in North Korea. Oh, I said, what was it like? He said, I'll tell you. We supplied all their arms and all that stuff. They never even invited me to their Pentagon. I never even found out where their Pentagon was. I was never invited outside the embassy. They never shared any information with me. The North Koreans were not trusting the Russians, even though the Russians were their main backer and their main supplier. Still, they had an embassy there. And once when I wanted to investigate what was going on, I went to Russia and I talked to 18 guys that had been in that embassy. And, you know, they, they did know things about North Korea. Anyway, um, um, they did make it a test case. So that's the end of the second part of this, uh, of this talk. Now, I want to say something about my collaboration with Colby. Um, Colby retired from the CIA in 76. And in 1977, um, I was asked to speak to Young Americans for Freedom, a very conservative group about disarmament. And I thought, well, Jeremy, you're going to have your head handed to you here because they won't agree with your ideas about disarmament. And, uh, but, they, but Colby was there, and he started talking about how uh, we could monitor disarmament with all of our surveillance capabilities, and, you know, and disarmament was a very safe thing, he said, because we could really do it. So when it was my turn to speak, I said, you know, I, I, I can't address this subject more eloquently than the former director of Central Intelligence, Mr. Bill Colby. I associate my remarks with his. And when we, the meeting was over, I chatted with Bill Colby, and I discovered he opposed the B-1 bomber, which was something I was in the middle of campaigning against. So I went to the Foreign Relations Committee, which was 100 yards from my office. I used to go there every day. And I said to the staff, did you know Colby was a dove on the arms race and disarmament? Because everybody thought of him as a hawk. In Vietnam, he had been a hawk. And he had led uh, intelligence operations in Vietnam, an operation called Operation Phoenix, where they tortured many, many, many Viet Cong. And he had written a book how we could have achieved victory in Vietnam if we'd stuck with it. And he was a real hawk on Vietnam. So everybody thought he was a conservative. But actually, in his political views, he was a liberal. And so anyway, I told him that, um, told the Foreign Relations Committee this. And they said, the staff said immediately, great, we'll have a hearing. And you can testify too, which was a kind of finder's fee, since I had discovered this. I could testify too. And they invited this man, Daniel Graham, who was a very conservative general, who was the head of the intelligence agency of the Pentagon. So they had this hearing, and the two of us uh, beat up on Graham. The Foreign Relations Committee was delighted with the results. They had my views on disarmament. And Colby became famous then in the arms control community as a really terrific asset because he had been head of central intelligence and he was for arms control and disarmament. So everywhere I went for arms control talks, I would see Colby riding around in an old jalopy and speaking. And once we actually went to a debate together in Denver and flew back on the airplane and we became more friendly, but we were still just um, uh, acquaintances. And, um, um, and, but in 89, 
I returned from Cambodia <clears throat> where I was trying to prevent the return of the Khmer Rouge. The Khmer Rouge had killed a quarter of all the Cambodians. It was the, one of the greatest genocidal massacres on earth. And, <clears throat> and uh, there were rumors and reports that they were going to get back in charge. The Vietnamese had invaded Cambodia and overthrown the Khmer Rouge. But it looked like they might return. I wanted to stop that. I was desperate to stop that. I worked three day, years, day and night, to stop that. And I took, I said, Colby, would you have lunch with me? I want to talk to you about something. And I said, could you help me with this? I'm going to need help. And he said, well, you know, I'm a hawk on Vietnam, but on Cambodia, you know, I, I could do this. And uh, so he began working with me. And we testified before the Foreign Relations Committee on Cambodia. And we wrote two op-eds together. And uh, so we became more friendly. And in 1992, we worked together on the Yugoslav problem of lifting the siege of Sarajevo. He said, oh, I'm an old artillery man, Jeremy, I can help you with this. And we wrote an op-ed explaining how America should get in there and lift the siege of Sarajevo, where the Serbs were shelling the Bosnian Muslims for years. So we worked together on that too. And uh, so we'd become pretty friendly. And we were invited to their home on Thanksgiving and Christmas dinners, my wife and I. He had married a second wife, Sally Shelton Colby. And she had been, I knew her a little bit in the Congress, she had been the aide to Senator Benson and then become ambassador to Grenada and some other related islands there. And, um, uh, and in the course of um, our chats with them, we told them, you know, we have this vacation home. Every weekend we go to the Chesapeake Bay where we have this house on this cliff overlooking the bay. And they didn't have a vacation home. And after hearing about this, they thought they should have one. So I introduced them to my realtor, Denise Gardner, and she started taking him around. Now, Bill Colby loved sailing, he loved the water, and she found him a house. This doesn't show up too well, but she found him a house on Cobb Island. Sorry about this, but what you're seeing there is, she found him a house on Cobb Island, which was had a road to it. 350 people lived on the island, but it was encircled by water. There was a river on one side, and there was the Potomac on the other side. And the Potomac was about to end up in the Atlantic. And Bill loved it because he loved the water. And one day he disappeared at sea. And everyone was looking for his body. And there were rumors in the papers, maybe the KGB killed him, you know, well, what could have happened to him? And during the week they were fishing for his body, I was in Seattle at the home of Robert Gates. That's 3,000 miles away. And why was I at the home of Robert Gates? I was writing my first uh, book of memoirs, and it involved CIA and Gates and things, and I was checking with him whether I had my facts right, you know, so I called on him to see whether I had everything right. From 3,000 miles away, Gates told me how Colby had died. So this is an example of how smart Gates was. Gates said, look at my house here. I have a house on a lake. He was showing me his house. There are 20 houses around this lake, and I have one of them. I have a pier. Here's my pier. You see on this, this canoe is tied up to my pier. Even though this lake is a body of water that's surrounded by land, it's a lake. When the wind blows, I cannot get that canoe up to the pier, lined up with the pier, because the wind blows on the side of the canoe so strongly that with one person with just a paddle, I cannot get the canoe to obey what I want. He said, Bill went out in the canoe at night. The Pacific is a very strong river, and the other river is a strong river. It was blowing him out to sea. In an effort to turn the canoe around, he was paddling <coughs> as hard as he could, and he must have had a heart attack <coughs> and tumbled into the water. When they found his body, that was exactly what happened. He had had a heart attack and tumbled out of the canoe. So I learned from one director of Central Intelligence Agency how another director of Central Intelligence Agency had actually died from 3,000 miles away. I mean, these guys are smart. And, and, uh, and learned to my horror that Colby had died, really, because he had taken the advice of my real estate agent to buy this house <coughs> on Cobb Island. Well, 
that completes my